Imagine a place of eternal peace, harmony, and joy. Does such a place known to many as heaven truly exist? This question has captivated the human mind for centuries, sparking curiosity, debates, and even wars. The concept of heaven, or a higher realm beyond mortal comprehension, is not unique to one culture or religion. It's a universal thought that transcends geographical boundaries and time periods. The ancient Egyptians envisioned it as a paradise of vast fields, where souls would farm and live in harmony, while the Vikings imagined Valhalla, a grand hall where warriors feasted after a glorious death. In the Abrahamic faiths, heaven is often depicted as a place of divine communion and endless joy, free from the suffering and turmoil of earthly life. But the idea of heaven is not just about the afterlife. It's also about the present, about how we live our lives today. The promise of heaven can inspire kindness, compassion, and virtue, guiding our actions towards a higher moral standard. It's a beacon of hope that illuminates the darkest corners of human existence, offering solace in times of grief and despair. Yet the notion of heaven is also deeply personal and subjective. For some it may not be a physical place but a state of mind or a feeling of inner peace. For others it might be the fulfillment of deepest desires or the reunion with loved ones. Despite these varying interpretations the core concept remains the same. Heaven is a place or state of ultimate happiness and tranquility, a reward for the virtuous and the faithful. But as we delve deeper into this fascinating topic we must also consider the other side of the coin. For many the belief in heaven provides comfort and hope. But could it also serve a more manipulative purpose? Is it a tool used to control behavior and maintain social order? In the following scenes, we'll explore these intriguing questions and more as we continue our journey into the realm of the divine. From another perspective, could the concept of heaven be a tool designed to control human behavior? This question might seem outlandish at first, but let's delve into it. The idea of heaven, an eternal paradise, has been a cornerstone of many religions. It has been painted as a reward for good deeds, adherence to moral codes, and compliance with religious doctrines. Now, let's consider the flip side of this coin. Hell, a place of torment and suffering, often depicted as the ultimate punishment for those who stray from the path of righteousness. The promise of heaven and the threat of hell thus create a potent dichotomy, an influential mechanism, if you will, that has the power to guide human behavior. Historically, religious institutions have been known to use the concept of heaven as a control mechanism. For instance, during the Middle Ages, the Catholic Church sold indulgences, a kind of get-out-of-hell-free card for monetary contributions. This was not just a fundraising tactic but also a way to control the masses, by instilling a fear of eternal damnation and offering a path to salvation. In a more contemporary context, we see a similar pattern in the way certain religious sects or cults operate. They often offer a vision of a utopian afterlife, attainable only through adherence to their specific doctrines and the leadership of their charismatic figures. This not only ensures loyalty, but also manipulates followers into conforming to the group's norms and expectations. Even on a more personal level, the concept of heaven and hell can shape individual behavior. It provides a moral compass, a set of guidelines on how to live one's life. The allure of a heavenly reward can motivate individuals to act in accordance with these guidelines, while the fear of hell can deter them from transgressions. So, we see that heaven for some is not just a place of eternal peace but also a powerful tool of influence. The notion of an afterlife, particularly a blissful one, can serve as a potent mechanism to control, guide and shape human behavior and societal norms. Now let's delve deeper into the nature of gods. Are they divine beings, or merely extraterrestrial life forms from other dimensions? This question may seem strange at first, but it's a theory that has gained traction over the years. The idea that gods could be advanced extraterrestrial beings isn't as far-fetched as it might initially seem. We're all familiar with the gods of myth and legend, beings with extraordinary powers, knowledge beyond human comprehension, and the ability to manipulate the world in ways that defy the laws of physics. But what if these gods were not divine but simply beings from another dimension or distant galaxy possessing technology far beyond our understanding? It's an intriguing thought, isn't it? The gods of old could be recast as advanced extraterrestrials, their magic merely the application of technology so advanced it appears miraculous to us. Let's consider the idea further. Many mythological gods have traits that could be explained by advanced technology rather than divine powers. For example, the ability to fly, once considered the domain of the gods, 
is commonplace today thanks to the invention of airplanes. Similarly, the ability to communicate instantly over vast distances, once the purview of deities, is now everyday reality with our smartphones and internet. Moreover, many ancient texts and scriptures describe gods descending from the sky or traveling between worlds, which could be interpreted as evidence of interstellar or interdimensional travel. Could it be that these gods were simply visitors from other parts of the universe, their actions misunderstood and their technology misinterpreted as divine power? The theory is not without its critics, of course. Many argue that it's a leap too far, a misinterpretation of ancient texts, or a fanciful reinterpretation of religious beliefs. But like all theories, it's worth considering, questioning, and exploring. The image of gods as divine beings or extraterrestrial entities challenges our traditional understanding, doesn't it? It invites us to look beyond our preconceptions and consider new possibilities about the nature of the divine and the universe itself. We've pondered the existence of heaven and the nature of gods. Now, let's turn our thoughts to religion itself. Is it purely spiritual guidance or could it be a form of control? To untangle this web, we need to first understand the concept of religion. At its core, religion is a system of beliefs and practices that, among other things, provides a moral compass to its followers. It creates a framework that helps individuals differentiate between good and evil, right and wrong. But here's where it gets interesting. These moral codes, these rights and wrongs, are they not societal norms and values? Indeed they are. Religion, through its teachings, plays an instrumental role in shaping these norms. It sets the standards for acceptable behavior and creates societal expectations. Take, for instance, the concept of charity. Many religions encourage almsgiving, fostering a culture of empathy and compassion. On the flip side, however, religions also prescribe punishments for transgressions. This is where we begin to see the control aspect of religion. It's not just about guiding, but also about enforcing. Religious rituals and practices further reinforce this control. Regular attendance at places of worship, for example, not only fosters community, but also promotes conformity. These rituals create a sense of belonging, but also subtly remind individuals of the collective expectations of their community. But it's not just about individual behavior. Religion also influences group dynamics. It can unite people under a common banner, but it can also create divisions. It can lead to peaceful coexistence, but it can also incite conflict. So, is religion a form of control? Well, it's not an easy yes or no. While it's undeniable that religion influences behavior, it's also a crucial source of spiritual and moral guidance for billions of people worldwide. Though religion does provide spiritual guidance, it's hard to ignore its powerful influence over societal norms and behavior. We've traversed a philosophical path today, questioning the existence of heaven, the nature of gods, and the role of religion. We've delved into the depths of these complex and evocative subjects, unraveling layers of belief, tradition, and interpretation. In our exploration of the concept of heaven, we've touched on the variety of interpretations across different cultures and religions. We've considered the possibility that heaven might serve as a mechanism of control, a reward promised for good behavior, or a comfort in the face of mortality. Yet we've also recognized that for many, the belief in heaven provides a profound sense of peace and purpose. Turning our gaze toward the gods, we've pondered whether they might be extraterrestrial beings or entities from other dimensions. We've reflected on the myriad ways in which gods have been envisioned throughout history and across cultures, from omnipotent deities to more human-like figures with strengths and flaws. This diversity of interpretations underscores the complexity and subjectivity of these concepts. Our discussion of religion's role in social control has been equally illuminating. We've examined the ways in which religion can foster social cohesion and establish moral codes, but also how it can be used to exert control and maintain power structures. Yet, we've acknowledged that for many, religion offers a sense of community, guidance, and solace in a complex world. It's clear that these topics are as intricate as they are personal. Each person's understanding of heaven, gods, and religion is shaped by their individual beliefs, experiences, and cultural context. Whether heaven is real, gods are extraterrestrial beings, or religion is a control mechanism, the answers largely depend on individual beliefs, experiences, and perspectives. As we continue our journey of understanding, may we always keep an open mind and respect the diversity of beliefs around us.